Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar tonight. Um, we've got a fantastic speaker, Simon Platt, who will be uh, discussing with you the three essential things you need to know about each anti-epileptic drug. Um, this webinar is brought to you by PRN Pharmacal. And before um, I introduce Simon, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about our uh, sponsor tonight. PRN Pharmacal has a very long standing history of bringing educational resources to the veterinary industry. Um, and we are very honored to be partner with them um, with this um, webinar tonight. In addition to providing educational resources, PRN Pharmacal also manufacture potassium bromide, which as neurologists, we use a lot, um, specifically formulated for dog with idiopathic epilepsy. Uh, but they also manufacture a number of other products that meet the needs um, of veterinary clinic, but also their client. Uh, PRN Pharmacal is located in Pensacola, Florida, and they are dedicated to developing specialized therapeutics that address the unmet, undeserved, but also overlook need of a veterinary medicine community since 1978. Um, after this webinar, feel free to visit their website if you want to know more about uh, PRN and their website address is PRN Pharmacal in one word dot com. That leave me now to introduce our speaker tonight, which if you follow us on this Facebook page, you know very well Simon Platt. Um, Simon and I, we've been uh, joined at the hip, if I could say, for the last 20 years, even if there is a big difference in height of his and my <laughs> hip. Um, but Simon is a um, professor of neurology at UGA in the US and also one of um, our consultants at Vetorical Teleneurology, which he run um, with myself. We provide um, neuroimaging report all over the world. Um, so feel free to contact us at vetorical.com. Tonight, Simon will discuss everything you need to know about anti-epileptic drug, but narrowing down to the three essential things for each of these anti-epileptic drugs. Simon, thank you very much for being with us tonight. And uh, the floor is now with you, for you. Okay, thank you very much, Laurent. Um, really appreciate that. And um, I got away a little easy there, probably at the end I won't. I was waiting for some, some uh, type of dig there. Didn't get it, the height thing. No, no. So I'll wait at the end. Okay, so thanks to everyone tuning in, whether you're live or this is uh, listening to the recorded version. Um, yeah, this, as Laurent said, is focused on the three things to know about each anticonvulsant. Um, so I toyed with the idea of just making like four different slides and that's it being done. But um, we're going to give you a bit of a whirlwind tour about what's out there. As Laurent said, thanks very much to uh, PR and Farmcal. Um, for teaming up with us again um, and supporting our endeavors to disperse this information out to um, our viewers uh, here. So thank you for that. Um, so three things to know, how have we done this? We're, we've got to delve into the literature to work out like how to use. This is gonna come from sort of experience as well as what is out in, um, uh, in uh, some of the formularies. Um, what do we actually know about, about uh, dosages and half-lifes, that sort of thing, and how should we monitor them serum-wise? Uh, does it work? Um, and so, what is the efficacy of, of each of each um, medication, and what adverse ex uh, effects to expect? So, those are the three things that we are looking at with each of these medications. As you know, we've got quite a few that we can choose from. Um, starting with phenobarbital, um, we have potassium bromide, um, levetiracetam, levetiracetam, however you want to pronounce that, uh, zinisamide, imepitoin, and then gabapentin or pregabalin. Um, so we're going to go through these um, with those three questions in mind. Important to know that whatever drug you start, we um, have to be comfortable with some criteria for starting. Uh, and looking across the board, there are several criteria to consider. Um, we'll often start a, a long-term medication based on a frequency. And 
uh, that frequency can vary from anywhere from one seizure a month to one seizure every six months. Uh, we've we've chosen a one seizure every three months as kind of the, the way to go. This is obviously a mutual decision with the owner as to um, what they are, are, are comfortable with, uh, how long they want to wait. We obviously want a pattern to those seizures to know if uh, an introduced medication is actually doing anything. Um, but we don't want to wait too long. Um, if we if we leave it to one seizure a week, for instance, or a couple of months, then we may have uh, got into a period of time where uh, the dog's brain is becoming a little bit too damaged from those seizures. And we may uh, find a refractory problem in the future. So there's a, there's a arbitrarily picked seizure frequency here. We also have um, severity of seizures themselves. So cluster seizures, more than a couple of seizures in 24 hours or so. And status epilepticus, a protracted period of seizure activity, at least more than five minutes. Um, these do uh, require the consideration for long-term treatment, lifelong treatment in dogs and cats, unless you have um, found that the uh, inciting cause is a toxin or is a metabolic disease, in which case perhaps um, lifelong therapy not going to be needed there. If you have an intracranial disease that's already been documented um, or there's been a history of head trauma, um, then maybe lifelong therapy needed. And some people will discuss um, the fact that the frequency or severity won't determine um, initiation in some patients, but the severity of post ictal activity may be. Some uh, patients may have post or behavior changes um, which go on for um, quite a, an extended period of time over, over 24 hours in some cases. And it's not that the drugs themselves will necessarily take that away, um, but they may in reducing seizure frequency and obviously reduce the frequency of post activity with it. Our principles of the use of all of these drugs are pretty much the same for, for each one of them in that we, we really look into obviously to maintain seizure control and we need to, even though we hope for eradication or elim elimination of seizures, we really need to explain to the owners that there's a strong possibility that doesn't occur um, and that we're just looking to reduce them down to an acceptable level while limiting unacceptable side effects, um, which is what we're going to talk about today. It is, as we've said, lifelong daily treatment, which uh, brings about a few problems, cost um, as one of them, um, um, but also a, a kind of labor intensity that some people might not want for their uh, for their dogs or cats, uh, and part of that is frequent re-evaluation. So we're going to need to see these patients back on, on average every six months once things are stable, but um, prior to that, maybe much more frequently. Owners need to realize even if things are going well, there's always a potential for emergencies, and these may be uh, in, uh, a rapid increase of seizure frequency or severity, or maybe toxicity related to the drugs, and, and that is something that we need to let the owners know of. However, rare, um, there's always that possibility. Some, some uh, conditions are relating to drug use in these patients are, are more frequent than others, and some are more severe than others. And that's, again, hopefully what we're going to cover. So no better place to start then um, when we talk about drugs as, as than uh, phenobarbital or phenobarbitone. Depends where you live. That's how you want to say it. Um, this is a pretty powerful anticonvulsant, still, still rated as the most powerful one known in human medicine but less commonly used now because of the sedative side effects um, and um, has a, a variable half-life depending on individual dogs anywhere from from 37 to 73 hours similar in the cat um, after an individual pill you're going to get a maximal plasma concentration of four to eight hours some protein um, binding to consider here which may interfere with uh, with other drugs that are protein bound um, so need to monitor that major thing here is that this drug is metabolized in the liver and is a bit of the architect of its um, own downfall in that it does it does induce hepatic microsomal enzymes so the more that the more you give the more these hepatic microsomal enzymes are induced and potentially then the more phenobarb will be metabolized so uh, ultimately you may need to end up giving more of a, of a dose what doses do we give? This is our then first question, how to use this drug. Um, variable uh, 
doses are recommended. We'll go with a kind of an arbitrary pick of anywhere from two and a half to four mg per kg, um, usually twice a day at first in dogs. But be aware, and this is one take home message, that some of the drugs um, that we use for their anti convulsant effect in dogs and cats might not work so well. Um, uh, at, at a certain time, I may, dogs may become tolerant of them. Um, and it may not be a case of just increasing the dose that fixes that situation. We might actually need to decrease the dosing interval. Now, this is, is going to be a practical issue for some owners. But instead of going every 12 hours for phenobarb, if we get into trouble and we need this drug to do a better job, we might actually go three times a day. Um, so some something to think about, take home message, not necessary to, for us to increase the dose. Sometimes we increase the frequency. In cats, twice a day still as well, kind of a lower dose. They're a bit more um, susceptible to sedative side effects. And we're giving this drug and we're waiting based on that half-life um, roughly a couple of weeks until we get to what's called the steady state. Um, and at that steady state time period here, um, there's pretty much uh, a minimal flux uh, between peak and trough. And so we can rely on it. Consistent, um, most effective for the dose we've just given. So we give it, we then wait a couple of weeks to see how it actually is now helping with seizure frequency. Um, the target ranges that, that are given are, are in dogs between 15 and 45 micromole per liter. Depends what units you use, a slightly different unit system out there um, and um, 20 to 30 microgram per milliliter um, in cats a slightly uh, narrower field roughly in dogs 20 percent of dogs will need less than that target 60 percent will be treated effectively within the target and 20 percent will need more so it's a guideline um, that therapeutic target level and we obviously got to treat the dog rather than that target level itself. Now we might not want to wait 14 days, right? So we're going to have to consider in some cases that we can load dose these um, patients. Most of the time that's with parenteral medication. There's some suggestion out there that you may get uh, an equal effect um, with oral medication, but most of the time we're going to uh, going to go with a parenteral version of phenobarbitone. 12 to 24 mg per kg is recommended as the total dose. Um, and we give that over 24 hours and we fractionate it intravenous, intramuscular. So we might give six mg per kg and then four to six hours later, another six mg per kg. And we give that, and after 24 hours, it's suggested then we are at steady state and we can follow up with our um, oral maintenance dose, the twice a day dosing. And what we're then looking for is to assess um, what that serum level is when we when we have reached steady state. Um, we can take that blood test any time, pretty much any time during the day. It's suggested that the trough is best because that's the time that we will um, have the lowest concentration. Um, so we can really compare apples to apples if we're constantly looking at the, that, that in, in every dog. Um, but it doesn't make too much difference if we take it at, at another time during the day, whatever's practical. Um, and we're looking to see how close we get to that therapeutic level. Remember what we've said is it's a guideline, right? So um, we're not necessarily needing to change anything if the dog's doing well. Uh, if you're within a therapeutic range, but you consider that your control is poor based on frequency or severity, we could increase that oral dose um, until the serum level gets that top end of the normal range. And we'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a bit more in a second. If you're under the therapeutic range, but there's no seizures, um, if you feel like everything's controlled, then just, just monitor the patient. We don't need to really change anything. And if you're at the top end or above that range, but there's still poor control at that time period, we're probably looking for a second drug and we'll explain what that is. Maybe 20% need more than that top end, um, but we're probably not going to give them more because of the risk of toxicity. So the recommended monitoring that we have to do in this patient, as we'll talk about when we come to adverse effects, is, is a bit labor intensive and can be expensive. But if possible, every six months, we're going to look at serum concentration levels of phenobarbital. Even if everything's going well, we want this because, because it will be good historical data to look at if something goes wrong in the future.
uh, hematology we're going to look at that as so we'll talk about for bone marrow function and we're going to look at serum chemistry um, for uh, an assessment of, of any liver issues uh, but mostly for that we're going to focus on getting a functional liver assay so every six months if possible um, pre and postprandial bile assays would would be ideal if owners can't afford that then every every 12 months would be would be a kind of minimum that we'd accept um, and are we going to get to a stage in some dogs where that serum level reaches that the top end or reaches at least 35 and we still don't have seizures controlled to, uh, to where we would like them to be um, or there's some side effects affecting the quality of life again we'll talk about or we have something a little bit more concerning like liver disease and we're then going to need to think about a second drug ideally if you have time we would like to add a second drug to phenobarbitone and then see what happens and then slowly wean phenobarbitone down if there is um, um, if there is positive effect of this added on drug rather want to do one thing at a time uh, then stop phenobarb which you might not think is doing a lot but it might be doing something and there is a risk of uh, withdrawal seizures with phenobarb so how effective is it? So our question two for factoid two for phenobarbitone is, well, what's the efficacy? And trawling through the literature, we've got some overview here that we can go through. Um, it's considered pretty pretty much the most effective of our anticonvulsants, um, even as a monotherapy, but can be used in, as an adjunctive treatment as well. Um, Depending on who you read, anywhere from 20 to up to 85% have seizure eradication um, and 20 to 40% will have over 50% um, improvement, just slightly less than 100%. Um, even more than we'll have just over 30 percent reduction so it depends what you look for and this is where there's problems in the literature when you, when you hear about a drug being successful what does success actually mean um it may be it may be reducing seizure frequency but it might not be doing that um uh, to a satisfactory level and so we need to look at how each drug works in terms of seizure eradication as well as affecting the frequency of seizures um Overall, it seems like about 15% of dogs or patients were on this drug won't be touched by it. Um, so overall, we think maybe 85% are going to have some improvement on it. Um, when we look at cats, similar sort of story. Um, look at these studies again, trawl through them and see what we've got. Um, there are some sort of meta-analysis studies, um, some, some here as uh, we're going to refer to a few times, that have done these pyramid schemes here where... Um, the good ones, not the bad ones, um, where um, we see that phenobarb uh, comes out on top for, for efficacy in cats um, compared to some of the other drugs based on the literature. Uh, and we look at these literature studies. This one, idiopathic epileptic cats, 36 of them followed for a year. Eradication, 45%. Um, good control, 25%, poor control, 30%. So we're adding this up here, we're, we're looking at maybe 70% of cats where we're, we're pretty happy that the seizure severity and duration is decreased and quality of life is considered good. So there's a pretty good ballpark to remember, 70% um, improvement here. A slightly smaller study, but idiopathic epileptic cats, again, seizure eradication, 44%, adequate control, 31%. So in cats, we're looking at about, again, 70, 75%, where we've got a reasonable improvement, 25% um, inadequately controlled. Uh, when looking at cats with other diseases, um, again, seems to be uh, fairly similar. Um, this study looked at uh, some cats that had unknown possible idiopathic epilepsy, 19 of those compared to 11 with structural diseases such as inflammation and tumours. Um, showed that seizure control was achieved during uh, when serum levels were within that target area uh, and overall 13 cats were seizure free so not just decreased uh, seizure frequency but seizure free so pretty good efficacy a very earlier paper on this 30 cats with structural epilepsy found seizure eradication or pretty low seizure frequency in, in nearly 60 percent um of patients um so so we we see we seem to have something that uh is familiar to all these studies that a lot a lot of cases can benefit from these but don't be surprised if if there's an individual cat 
um, that doesn't, um, and we'd have to look for a second medication. But obviously, in in making a choice about the drug, you have to consider adverse effects. Again, this meta-analysis study here looked at um, the side effects that are reported in studies. Now, I want to draw your attention because you're going to see some charts throughout this um, session um, that look quite similar, but the canine charts that I'm showing you here are percentages of the studies that reported these signs. So it's not percentage of dogs, percentage of studies that reported these adverse effects. So these are the adverse effects that are actually reported. So there, there's quite a lot of them with phenobarb, um, but um, it doesn't mean that over 50% will have these problems. These were the amount of studies. Um, so when we look at the most common ones, what do we see? Well, those that are dose related, so sometimes called predictable or type one um, adverse effects, you're going to see sedation and ataxia, polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia. This is pretty standard for the use of this drug. And most of the time that will improve once you get to steady state. Each time you change the dose, you may see it again. Um, not a lot of residual um, um, adverse effects when we talk about these guys. Hyperactivity is a possibility. Uh, they may be agitated, vocalize, appear in pain. Uh, again, kind of dose related, but many times we have to just stop the drug. If you've ever seen a dog be hyperactive on the, on this drug, uh, there's not many owners that actually will, will go for just a trial and error dose reduction. We end up having to stop the drug a little bit. Oh, completely. Um, there are idiosyncratic problems with this, and that kind of just means bad luck, right? Um, type two, unpredictable. Um, we'll see this guy here, and that's what determines whether you start using this drug or not to a lot of people, um, even though we're not really sure of the prevalence of it. Um, acute toxic hepatopathy can be a killer, so it can be fatal. It can be reversible, though, if you catch it early enough. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Um, but we also see immune-mediated bone marrow suppression, and that can be uh, often is within the first six months, but can be one cell, um, such as a thrombocytopenia, or, or it can be multiple, like anemia, thrombocytopenia, um, uh, neutropenia. So we can see those things estimated to be nearly 4% of patients. So it's worth looking out for. This is why every six months we would want to do hematology. Uh, and then some patients reported with skin lesions and described as superficial necrolytic dermatitis. Um, not attractive, um, as you can see by this guy. Someone loves this guy, um, so that's okay. Um, but um, not really attractive, meant again to be reversible. Then. Um, so what is this liver disease thing? It is something which there's been uh, at least one study on suggesting that we've got some things objective to Mosifor. As we said, it's reversible, uh, you, it, especially if you get there before the fibrotic disease stage. Um, and it is more likely if the serum um, uh, level of, of phenobarb is above 35. So we use that as a guide now and say, once we get to 35, uh, probably let's look for a second drug rather than increasing phenobarb. And the drugs, that, the dogs that experienced this disease um, had been on phenobarb in this one study, had been on phenobarb over a year. So this is unlikely to be an overnight issue um, where we give the drug and then we see a problem and, and a median uh, duration of therapy in that study was 39 months, so a long period of time. So catching this um, is possible, especially if you were to look every six months. And one of the suggestions in that study was um, looking at ALT and alkaline phosphatase. Well, we know those enzymes go up or elevated or, or as some people say, induced by this drug. Um, and so they may be meaningless. We do see alkaline phosphates go extremely high, but what the suggestion was is that if your ALT levels go up and your alkaline phosphatase doesn't tend to go up in the same type of um, uh, quantity, um, uh, mag to uh, same type of magnitude, then you should be worried. So we really keep an eye on ALT. It's not that we're ignoring liver enzymes, but they don't tell us that we've got a liver dysfunction. So we need then to look for um, evidence of liver dysfunction with pre and postprandial bile acids, for instance, or uh, an ammonia serum level. Um, what about cats? What do we know about the use? Seems to be an effective drug, but we've got some adverse effects to look for. Um, some people say that, that it's a safer drug in cats than it is in dogs, um, but one study found that nearly half of cats had some type 
of adverse effect. And again, meta-analysis studies down here. Um, in cats, this is actually suggesting how many cats, not studies, how many cats actually had one of these issues. And you can see sedation is out here as um, a uh, leader really in, in the game. Um, so we, we, we see that that it's not really related to serum levels, but has been reported to be dose related, which uh, might not make much sense. But if once you're getting up to sort of uh, six to eight mg per kg twice a day, you know, you're probably getting some of these side effects. And most commonly, similar to dogs, sedation, polyphagia, ataxia, weight change. That can be gain or, or based on this meta-analysis, even a weight loss. No liver dysfunction, though, has been reported in cats. You may get elevated liver enzymes, um, but no actual liver dysfunction. So it seems to be a um, a safer drug because of that. And and in cats, um, there are reports of bone marrow dysfunction. One recent report of pancytopenia actually in cats. Um, but so uh, something that we're again going to have to watch out for. So our six monthly check in cats is always going to be serum level, um, liver enzyme evaluation um, and hematology, similar to dogs, but with less concern about liver dysfunction. Cats have also been reported to have these cutaneous eruptions and also concerningly a, a hypersensitivity to syndrome, uh, to phenobarb, which is manifested as lim lymphadenopathy uh, and occasionally accompanied by fever. And so you need to be cautious that you're not um, diagnosing these cats with something more nasty, um, such as lymphoma, for instance, um, and be aware that there is an anticonvulsant syndrome. It is stated that any animal can respond in this way to any anticonvulsant, not just phenobarb. So you should keep that in mind. If you have an animal that has lymphadenopathy plus or minus fever and they're on an anticonvulsant, start to think about the possibility it could be related to that. All right, so potassium bromide. Now I'm aware that in some countries this is only licensed as an adjunct. Um, however, uh, if you're able to use it as an as a monotherapy, we'll talk about that as as well. Um, it has found maybe more fame as an adjunct, and and, and mainly it, it, its use has revolved around the fact it's extremely safe. Um, it's not metabolized in the body, um, doesn't go through the liver, so that's one huge um, plus over the phenobarb is excreted in urine so we need to be a little uh, cautious about any patients that have renal dysfunction it's not that it, it will cause any renal issues it's just that it will accumulate in the serum so we're going to have to maybe use a slightly lower dose if we have patients that have a renal dysfunction. We also need to be aware that because it's a salt solution, a halide salt, potassium bromide, um, it bro the bromide will compete with chloride at the level of the kidney. And so high chloride diets can actually result in excessive excretion of bromide. So you need to be a bit cautious about what diet the patient is on. Um, a stable salt level will actually be better than a low, than, than a, an alternating salt level. So no snacks or um, table scraps, that sort of thing would be advised. Um, there's a lot of work out there to say that, that this drug is very synergistic because it, it works in a slightly different way to the other anticonvulsants, uh, but synergistic with, with phenobarb and with imepitoin. So how, question one, like factoid number one about this drug, how do we use it? Uh, 20 to 40 mg per kg, kind of a wide range, depending on whether you're using it as a primary drug or as an adjunct. So um, no problem going to 40 mg per kg straight out of the gate if you're using it on its own. And it's a once a day drug, but you can split it up to twice a day if you find that it's too much at one go. This is a sedative drug as well, it, it, as we'll talk about can uh, cause some stomach irritation if uh, if it's uh, given in a high dose. Half-life is the problem with this drug. Um, it's a quite variable, but quite long. Look at that. We were talking, we were talking maybe two or three days with phenobarb, and now we've got over, over a month in some cases with bromide, and that results in a long um, time to steady state. So that can be a bit, a bit of a problem. Um, owners might not want to wait that three-month period. Um, Again, though, there is a serum concentration to um, to check this drug out with. And the suggestion is that many dogs will respond within this level, um, its concentration. Uh, if you're using 
higher you, if you're using monotherapy a higher serum concentration is aimed for so some people quote about 3000 again all, there'll be different units in different countries but um, use this as a guide in some patients you can overshoot the top end um, because the patient's doing well doesn't really have any side effects but needs more drug there, there are limited side effects that are dose related in this drug so that's how we're going to use it but what if we don't want to wait the the uh three months well we could load dose this this drug um we can load dose it by giving a high dose some various recipes out there but here's a review of one of them um 400 to 600 milligram total big per kick big per kick total um by mouth and we're giving this divided over four to six days Again, several recipes are out there published, but we'll go with this one, 100 mg per kg per day divided. And we'll divide it up because, as we said, this is a strong sedative and can cause some gastritis if you give it at a um, high dose. So 100 mg per kg divided, we might just choose then to go with 25 milligrams per kilogram four times a day, something like that. Um, and follow up then after that four to six days um, with a maintenance dose. Um, now, I would advise, depending on your relationship with the client, what the dog's like at this time, that you suggest hospitalizing the patient at that time because many of them, just like the phenobarb loading, will become pretty sedate and ataxic and that can be quite upsetting to the owner. At least need to check in with them daily um, and they should be made aware that they will get used to those side effects. They're dose-related, uh, transient most of the time, but um, they can be very upsetting. Um, uh, you can go from a happy little dog to an extremely drunk and sedate one and a slightly irritated owner. Just personal experience that I'm lending your way here. Um, okay, so how does it, uh, um, what's its efficacy? Does it work? Um, so let's again trawl the literature, a few studies out there, again, some good meta-analysis stuff done, done here by Marios um, and this uh, pyramid the good pyramid scheme here um, puts puts potassium bromide um, towards the top end of it, um, just underneath phenobarb and imepitoin, and uh, effective in anywhere from sort of 50 to 80 so percent of dogs. Remember, effective means it's it's doing something um, to the seizure frequency. When looked at monotherapy, if you want seizure eradication, then half of dogs. So, so less than phenobarb, obviously, but seizure eradication in half of dogs is pretty good. Overall seizure reduction in more than 50%, but less than that eradication, 22%. Combine these two, you're looking at over sort of 75% of dogs who are positively affected by it. So that's pretty good, right? Pretty good. Um, uh, let's look at cats. Well, we haven't mentioned cats for good reason with, with potassium bromide, but we'll at least look at efficacy to get us started. Um, would sound like a good drug in cats because it can be given just once a day and it has such a long half-life that if your cat goes missing for a day or two, it won't really affect the serum level too much. Um, its effectiveness, depending on what study we read, ranges from 35 to 66%. Um, and again, makes its way halfway up the pyramid uh, for cat treatment. Uh, seizure eradication, nearly like 60% uh, of cats um, uh, in, in this one study here. 47% um, of cats in another study and five cats out of five, hundred percent seizure eradication was seen. So it has, it has variable success rate, it seems, and seems to be a, a, a decent drug to think about, but as many of you already know, not commonly used because of the side effects, and we're going to get there in a second. So factoid three about bromide, what are the adverse effects? So there, again, are many of them. And remember in dogs, the meta-analysis study in dogs, this is expressed as a percentage of studies out there, not percentage of dogs, so percentage of studies that are uh, reported. Um, Type 1, so this is the predictable dose-related stuff, very similar to phenobarb. We've got PUPD, so polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, ataxia sedation. Again, not many of them will be residual, but if you combine this drug with phenobarb, then you're going to see some of these become a little bit more residual and can be a bit of a problem. Uh, vomiting, we mentioned because this is a salt solution, essentially, and can cause gastritis. 
Um, and then we've got hyperactivity and um, behavioral abnormalities. Look at this, hyperactivity reported with monotherapy in 60% of studies. Remember studies, right? So if there was on, if there were only like uh, 10 studies, then six, six of them reported that. So that's how this chart's working. Um, this is important to know. Um, it doesn't seem like like uh, it's a, it's a game changer for owners um, at all. But you have to look into the literature at where this drug came from. Uh, this was the first anticonvulsant ever used in people in the 1800s, nearly as old as Laurent and I. Um, Look, Laurent, I included you in that just just to be friends. Um, so uh, 1800s, and it then was withdrawn because it caused psychopathic murdering tendencies. Um, now that's not what we're referring to here. Um, we haven't seen a dog pick up a knife yet, but um, in the in interesting in this day and age where if you forget history you try to recreate it bromide has been brought back on the market for human treatment in children with refractory epilepsy so if you live next to a child who is on potassium bromide worthwhile moving in case you are murdered in your bed uh, and the child gets off with it just throw that out there these are tips from the top that's not personal experience though. Um, okay, so we've got behavioral abnormalities. They're pretty mild, but owners will occasionally report them. They're dose related. Now we've got these type two things. These are the unpredictable idiosyncratic things. They may not go away if you change the dose. Uh, we see here in this meta-analysis, again, based on studies, not number of dogs, studies, pancreatitis has been reported and there's some question about is that always in association with phenobarb but we need to look out for that um, paniculitis so some skin issues have been reported as well again people that were put on this uh, were reported to have psychogenic pruritus where they would scratch their skin down to their scat to their skull which is not that attractive um, uh, again not seen that but we've seen some dogs with some muzzle related pruritus uh, some reports that you can get a generalized neuromyopathy so weak pelvic limbs um, in uh, sometimes called bromism so related to uh, a higher dose but still suggested to be more of a uh, idiosyncratic problem no one knows why you get it uh, and megaesophagus as a possibility but so overall a pretty safe drug um, compared to uh, the, the issues that we talked about with phenobarb uh, what about in cats though well this is why we don't use it in cats um, it, uh, although it was a practical drug to use and it seemed to have some efficacy what was found was idiosyncratic allergic pneumonitis or feline asthma in four out of ten cats so quite a lot um, of, of cats showing a problem and in some of those at least one out of ten of those that got those signs they would die so it would be fatal um, this is a slow drug in onset and it will be a slow drug in offset stopping the drug it's going to take a long time to get out of the body and if this is in any way related to the presence of the drug then that will be a problem um so sedation and ataxia are all, also seen but the the big problem was the uh, feline asthma like signs and that's why it's really not used in cats okay so then we come on to some of the newer drugs in this mind this is some people's favorite if you can get hold of it and was said to be the new phenobarb and that is um because it's a twice a day drug and, the, and there was initial stories about pretty good success but there are some things that also parallel phenobarb that we'll talk about and, and not not least is that it goes through the liver here so there's a couple of uh, phases of hepatic metabolism that it hits both of so it goes through the liver um, need to watch that excreted out in the urine um, and like we'll talk about with levoteracetam, phenobarb use increases the clearance of this drug pretty dramatically. So you'll need to use a higher drug, drug dose in the presence of phenobarb. Another thing to know about it, another factoid uh, in using this is it's a sulfur-based drug and some of the side effects we've seen are related to that um, um, Com that component of the drug itself. How do we monitor this drug? Um, we didn't really say much about bromide monitoring because that was just going to be serum levels, right? Uh, after we administer the drug and then uh, potentially every six months. Uh, but with phenobarb, it's a bit more intensive and with zinisamide, it's a bit more intensive as well. The advice is actually prior to treatment, you should look at he hepatic enzyme activity, get a baseline, electrolytes, 
maybe even blood gas analysis that's pushing it a little bit um but i'll explain why in a second and hematology and it, and if not at least prior then definitely regularly again so maybe every six months um, so i'll explain this but there's some labor intensity associated with zanisamide um how do we use it in dogs and cats um well there is a rough dose here of three to seven mg per kg twice a day advised. Um, it was pushed up to 10 mg per kg twice a day, but there's been some association with that higher dose in dogs um, causing thyroid function issues. And so part of your assessment sometimes is thyroid function in, in these dogs. Um, in cats that hasn't been seen, and in some uh, some reports, it may just be a once a day drug that you could get away with because it has a longer half life. If not, try it twice a day, but I would start off once a day, five to 10 mg per kg. Uh, just as a factoid here, rectal administration is not suitable for use in dogs when you're trying to administer this. Uh, if you uh, are looking towards a more emergent presentation, but uh, levetiracetam is different uh, in that respect. Um, and while we don't tend to be very aggressive about monitoring some of the serum levels of these newer drugs, um, as opposed to bromide and phenobarb, there is a recommendation that you should monitor zanisamide uh, in serum or plasma uh, seven days after you initiate it, getting trough levels, and then maybe every six months, only because um, if you uh, go above the recommended serum level, then you start to get a risk of thyroid suppression. Um, what about efficacy? So factoid two about what you should know about zanisamide is efficacy. So first up are these older studies where it was used as an adjunct. A um, couple of studies here. This was 12 dogs um, that had refractory epilepsy already on phenobarb. Um, their dose was uh, roughly about nine milligrams per kilogram. And their response rate was about 60%, right? So 60% had some positive improvement. Uh, that was good. Um, 10 dogs in this other study, 10 mg per gig twice a day, about an 80% response rate. So again, response rate means you've got improvement, doesn't mean seizure eradication. So it seems as an adjunct that there's some reasonable um, efficacy here. But what about monotherapy? Can we use this on its, on its own? Well, there's only one trial out there. Looked at 10 dogs with idiopathic epilepsy. Um, and this study used a varying dose, 5 to 15 mg per kg. Um, twice a day. Remember, anything over 10, there's a risk of that thyroid issue coming up. Um, and it was showed that 60% of dogs were favorable responders, showing more than 50% reduction. So it seems overall, based on just these three studies, two as an adjunct and this is monotherapy, that this drug has some benefit, um, not as powerful though as phenobarb. So ranges around the sort of six out of 10, we're going to expect an acceptable benefit. Um, in cats, not much work done on cats and, and the efficacy. Um, there's one small study um, that was done that looked at um, uh, idiopathic epileptic cats and zanisamide um, and showed a 50% reduction in, in three of them. Um, so so uh, potential for improvement. And then there's this study, which didn't really look at seizure frequency, but did uh, e an EEG study. Um, and they used zanisamide at... Um, at various doses to get them into the therapeutic range, the serum level here, which is recommended to be therapeutic in, in humans, um, and showed that once you were in there, the abnormalities that you see on EEG, these paroxysmal discharges that you can see, um, they were reduced. And so some scientific evidence there that potentially this will work, but otherwise not a lot of clinical evidence on efficacy in cats. Now, what are the adverse effects? Remember, we said this goes through the liver and we said that it is a sulfur drug and, and various reports of side effects uh, up to 55% of cases. Again, this meta-analysis here is a percentage of studies that's reporting these things. And we find that the most common stuff is sedation and ataxia um, and then some GI stuff, vomiting and anorexia. Certainly low 
total T4. This is very much like um, we talked about with phenobarb. We didn't really touch on the, the total T4, but we can see that with phenobarb as well and elevated liver enzymes. So very similar to phenobarb. Um, uh, KCS, so the sulfur-related um, dry eye we might see. And then there is a report of a mixed acid base disorder and the dog presented panting in response to this related to apparently to the renal tubular acidosis. So there are some side effects. Overall, reasonably safe though here. here. Um, and um, there's just one major thing to watch out for besides that, that acidosis, and that is the potential of liver dysfunction. Now, in the early days of its, uh, of its use in humans, this was tested on beagles and was found to be safe at 75 mg per kg per day, so high doses. And they treated these dogs for a year, found out that some of them had hepatomegaly, had hepatomegaly some of them had alkfos, alkaline phosphatase elevations, uh, but no clinical disease. So it was said to be safe, but we know that you don't treat dogs for just a year with an anticonvulsant. So um, with longer term treatment, there are now some reports too, actually, that say um, there's an idiosyncratic liver toxicity that raises its head with the use of this drug. One dog, it was reversible, one dog died. Um, so worth keeping an eye on this um, with liver function tests. And so again, maybe every six months, this is not going to be a bad idea to check closely on the serum level and liver enzymes and also um, um, liver function testing. What about adverse effects in cats? And this may be more than the fact there isn't much information on its efficacy. This may be um, the reason it's not really taken off too much in, in cats um, is because the, the majority of them, well, I won't say majority, half of them then have adverse effects. Um, and and they're, they're side effects in cats that really bother owners, the anorexia, uh, GI stuff of diarrhea and vomiting, definitely. Um, and a bit of somnolence, doesn't bother too many owners because their cat just sleeps a bit more, hangs out, that's fine. But is, is it is ataxic? Um, now this study, uh, was done at 20 mg per kg per day. So it's a reasonably high dose for a cat. Um, so it's something it's something that may not be seen with much lower doses, but with clinical use, occasionally we'll see cats have these issues. So just to watch out for, we're not too sure about how efficacious it is, but it's a once a day drug possibly in cats. And we're not too sure about whether your cat's gonna get a side effect here. But then we come on to this drug again, biggest problem. No one really knows how to say it. Um, Levateracetam, levateracetam, uh, whatever you want. You can say it the way you want. Um, yeah, the main thing we got to talk about first off is how we're going to use it. Um, now, there is a standard version and an extended release version. Um, both of them very safe because they're not metabolized in the liver. So much like potassium bromide starts off from a very safe footing here with very low protein binding, but a rapid onset, like pretty rapid um, half-life is two, three, three to five hours here. Um, the problem has been that a, a lot of suggestions have, uh, have, have come around for a three times a day dose, 10 to 20 mg per kg three times a day but it seems that maybe some dogs are going to need four times a day and I'll, I'll kind of back that up by this study that we did when we compared immediate release in red to the sustained or extended release in green you can see that by eight hours it's actually out of the system pretty much right and so you've got this period of time here where it could be ineffective right so um, in some dogs, um, you may need to go four times a day so that you've only got the six hour concern. Um, and that's not practical for, for many for many owners, right? Well, then what about extended release? So I appreciate that's not available all around the world. Um, but if you can get hold of it, this is something that potentially you could give um, at least uh, twice a day, if not once a day in some dogs. Um, and you can see out here that's still at pretty reasonable therapeutic concentrations uh, eight hours after the medication. Um, so this is this this gives us a a drug that may be a little bit more um, sustained in or well sustained in the plasma. So um, we can give it at, at smaller intervals. Its main problem is that um, it has a pretty high um, dose formulation. So 
the smallest tablet size is 500 milligrams, which means for a cat, then um, you might be dosing at about 100 milligrams per kilogram. However, a very wide safety margin, although we talk about 10 to 20 mg per kg, many people will push this easily up to 60 mg per kg. And in one study where they gave the XR 100 mg per kg on average, um, was very safe. The only issues they saw, ataxia sedation, so pretty safe. This is a drug also that's um, been discussed for cluster seizures and there's a pulse treatment protocol out there. I thought I'd throw this in if we're talking about how we use this drug and it mainly based on the fact that it kicks in quite quickly. Um, and so the, the therapy that was proposed um, was using a very high dose, uh, so what, 60 mg per kg, still pretty safe. Um, orally, you could inject it if you want. Um, after that first seizure occurs, if your patient is a clusterer, and then fall back to the maintenance dose until the seizures don't occur for 48 hours. And then you could stop. That's what the pulse treatment aspect is. And so you might not want to use this long term for whatever reason. Uh, you might be using other drugs long term. But on top of those, you can go with this pulse therapy. Um, so something to consider and, and seems to be uh, anecdotally reasonably su successful. Uh, a bit more on how we use this drug. Worthwhile, like zanisamide, knowing that um, you, w even though it doesn't go through the liver, using it with phenobarb will mean that you're going to have to use a slightly higher dose. And so we'll push it way above that 20 mg per kg if they're already on phenobarb as well. Um, but a slightly lower dose if you have renal dysfunction because it's excreted um, out, out of the kidneys. So we know that that... Um, that use of, of phenobarb is going to increase clearance uh, in epileptic drug, drug, dogs. There is a liquid version uh, available in many areas, or you could get it compounded. Uh, so you can use it orally in small in the smaller dogs and in the cats. And there is an intravenous version available in some countries, again, that we use for emergencies, pretty much like that cluster um, protocol. So we're using at least 60 milligrams per kilogram. This drug received some bad press because of a honeymoon period that after about three months or a bit more, the initial effect started to wear off. So everything's great at first and then it's not great. Um, well, this um, was a little overplayed um, and, and I think now has, has tainted the use of this drug. Um, because although this could be seen, it can be seen with any drug, literally, definitely with other anticonvulsants. So um, don't be too worried about this. Don't say, oh, I won't use it because it's got a honeymoon period. Um, it's worth still trying out. But it's a reality that that just like other anticonvulsant drugs, there may be an onset of, to of tolerance to this medication. Um, um, again, we don't we don't necessarily be very, we're not necessarily very aggressive about monitoring serum levels of levotiracetam, but there is advice that we should if you use it with phenobarb so that you know that you're not getting too much that is cleared out of the system um, uh, because of, of the use of or concurrent use of phenobarb. So that may be a good reason to get serum levels. Otherwise, like sinisamide, the serum levels themselves don't tend to correlate too well um, with effect in dogs. And so we're not really sure how to use them other than to make sure we're in some type of target range and that at least it's getting into the system. Well, well does it, if it does get into the system, does it work? Um, so again, let's look at some studies where initially early days, uh, the, this was looked at as an add-on, right? So as an adjunctive. And this was uh, in the smaller study, 15 dogs, um, varying doses, again, TID, three times a day here. Uh, they found a 54% decrease in seizure frequency, no side effects. Um, so 54% um, decrease. Uh, similar size, 14 dog study. Um, this looked at uh, an escalation where we had 10 mg per kg to then 20 mg per kg, and the response rate was pretty similar. Um, uh, that we're looking at at 64% here. Again, responding, right? That's that's usually in most studies suggested to be um, re decreasing seizure frequency by about 50% or more. So that's what response is. So small studies, but, and as it's an adjunct here. Um, well, then this study came out, which was a little concerning, and that is it's a is is a very well put together study, randomized, placebo controlled crossover trial. They looked at 34 dogs with idiopathic epilepsy, 
um, gave them the standard dose, 20 mg per kg, um, or placebo. So now we've got placebo coming in into the scene here, whereas most of these other trials have not had any placebo control. Um, and they were, after four weeks, they were then washed out and crossed over to the alternate treatment. Um, um, or the, sorry, the washout was four weeks and they were all, all given treatment for four months. So they received the dose or placebo for four months. They were washed out for four weeks and then received placebo or the treatment for four months. Um, so com comparing the two, um, found out that the reduction of seizures with levotiracetam was not really significant when compared to placebo. Uh, a big concern, there was a reduction seen. So weekly seizure frequency during the first treatment period decreased significantly um, when, when, when looking at levotiracetam relative to baseline. So that's good. Um, but apparently you could have just used placebo. So that's a concern when you're looking at these studies. Placebo does have in these client-owned dogs that are, that are undergoing trials, placebo does have an effect. Um, what about monotherapy? Um, those were all looking as an adjunctive and then we've got a monotherapy trial here. In this trial, 12 dogs were randomized to treatment with levotrastam or phenobarb. Um, standard doses, slightly low, 10 mg per kg uh, or 20 mg per kg here. Um, uh, and then they were compared. Um, five of the six levotorastam treated dogs and one of the six phenobarb treated drugs withdrew from the study due to insufficient seizure control. That's a little concerning. Five of six dogs in this study withdrew because levotorastam wasn't cutting it. Um, that's not good. Um, no significant difference in the monthly number of seizures before and after treatment with levotrestam. Okay, so not not um, placebo controlled, but similar results to, to the other study. Um, phenobarb treated dogs, not surprisingly, had significantly fewer treatments, uh, few, fewer seizures after their treatment. Um, and, and five of those dogs were considered true responders. Um, whereas none of the levotrestone ones. So, so what's going on? Anecdotally, there seems to be a lot of support for the use of this drug, but its efficacy is in question. Um, and the, the biggest question would, would be in both studies, um, through no fault of their own, is maybe we should just be using a higher or a more frequently administered drug, um, uh, or potentially just focusing on the extended release version. Um, so just be aware that levotorestem has a good reputation anecdotally, but there's some studies out there that say it's really not cutting it as we would think. Um, what do we know about in cats? Just one study really uh, out there for the generalized seizures that are, uh, we'll talk about the myoclonic ones shortly, but the generalized seizures that um, in idiopath uh, due to idiopathic epilepsy. Uh, 12 cats, it was an adjunctive trial, so it was added on 20 mg per kg three times a day, and seven out of 10 cats responded. Um, so again, it, it, these are this is retrospective stuff, um, but like the first two levotrestam dog trials, retrospective, adjunctive, and a suggestion that 60, 70% of cases are improving. Recently, a pretty good success was found in cats that specifically had audiogenic reflex seizures. Um, so uh, generalized seizures, uh, more, more, more commonly myoclonic variety, were seen to respond to levotrestam rather than phenobarb. And so if you're seeing cats with this type of seizure, onset then potentially worth uh, trying levotorastam out of the gates rather than phenobarb. Um, what are the adverse effects? Overall suggested to be a really safe drug, right? Um, a few a few players in the game here that we probably uh, would expect, sedation, ataxia, and behavior change through, uh, thrown into the ring here. Um, and a recent study um, showed uh, that behavior change is a, uh, is a real thing on this drug. Again, looking at a meta-analysis performed here of all studies, this is the percentage of studies that reported these side effects. Um, some, some of them did report behavior changes like aggression, disobedience, attention, attention seeking. Um, but this study looked at 84 dogs um, receiving levotrastam as a monotherapy or add-on or pulse, either, either any of those three, um, and then showed that there was a worsening of behavioral changes in 14 of 44 cases, uh, an emergence of new behaviors 
uh, in 14, uh, 4 of 44. And these 44 are, are dogs that already had behavior abnormalities, right? So 14 of 44 got worse uh, and new types of behavior uh, came out in, in some of them. Um, and a quarter of dogs without pre-existing behavioral abnormalities, so they entered into this trial, they were great, no behavior problems. Uh, they developed behavior changes associated with the administration, so we've got 25% here. Um, but it's not all bad, right? Not all bad in that some of them actually were noted to have a calmer behavior. Uh, increased activity levels, more energy. Uh, it sounds like we should all be taking this, particularly at this time in our lives. 2020, let's take lever to rest time. So a good time for this study to come out. 18% uh, positive behavior change. All right, good stuff. What about cats? Uh, again, pretty safe overall. And you see the meta-analysis that was done here puts lever to rest time at, at nearly the top of the safety pyramid here. Um, a bit of hypersalivation seen in some cats. So now this being the cat study, this is percentage of cats here. So hypersalivation seen in some cats may be dose related. Uh, transient sedation in ataxia seen and some inappetence um, has been reported as well. But overall, a pretty safe drug to use in, in cats. Um, so uh, worthwhile considering not a lot of efficacy data apart from that one, one study really. Uh, and then the audiogenic seizure study. Uh, and then finally, we, we're going to uh, focus then the last few slides on imepitoin, uh, marketed as Pexian. Now, many of you will know a lot about this in Europe, Australia, uh, some countries, though, um, uh, such as uh, USA, uh, this is not available yet. The FDA has just approved this, when I say just, actually over 12 months ago, uh, approved this drug um, for noise aversion in dogs. Um, so you'll see this coming onto the market for noise aversion in the US, but not approved yet as an anticonvulsant, um, uh, but probably off-label you'll be using it as an anticonvulsant. What's the deal with this drug? Um, well, been available now for at least seven years or approved for seven years in, in Europe, Australia, Canada. Um, it's a partial agonist at the benzo binding site GABA-A receptor. Right, so similar to where to where diazepam is going to strike. Um, so it is, and being a partial agonist, we don't really get the sedation and tolerance that may build up with other drugs that that will lock onto that receptor. And it has a dual function: anticonvulsant and anxiolytic. Hence, why it's been approved for noise aversion in dogs. Um, so anticonvulsant, anxiolytic. Um, no real harmful interactions um, have been noted with with other other drugs. It is metabolized in the liver though, uh, not excreted in urine really, so it's excreted predominantly in the feces, so no problems with renal insufficiency. Uh, need to monitor a little bit if you have some liver insufficiency, but uh, no, um, based on, on when it was pushed out, this drug, and also on literature that's out there, there's no therapeutic monitoring recommendations for the drug though, um, so makes it a little easy. Um, Doses range a little bit in recommendations, currently about 10 mg per kg twice a day, but one study suggested that uh, 19 mg per kg twice a day was meant to be optimal. Um, start If you start off at 10 mg per kg and it doesn't work after a week, then the suggestion is to push it up and get to a maximum of 30 mg per kg twice a day. Um, if you're using this with phenobarb, one study suggested reducing it slowly over a two to three month period if you're going to reduce it rather than just stopping it straight away. Uh, and no side effects were seen with a very slow or protracted withdrawal of the use of this drug. So that's kind of how to use the drug. Fact two about this drug is efficacy. What do we know about its efficacy? A uh, reasonable amount of studies have been published in the last seven years on this uh, drug and dogs, effective to some degree. Um, remember, we talked about reduction of seizures, maybe not eradication, but reduction in 65 to 75% of dogs that in, based on the studies that are out there. Um, so maybe sits in between zanisamide and um, potassium bromide uh, and phenobarb. And again, here, meta-analysis study um, that was done in 2014, put phenobarb at the top and imepitoin sitting just behind it, just above potassium bromide and then leave a times in this mind. Um, eradication of seizures seen in 30, up to 33% of dogs. So again, so it has some reasonable effect here. Um, 
um, but not, not as powerful as we said as, as phenobarb. A couple of studies to go through. The, there's a randomized blind control um, clinical field trial that showed no differences in monthly seizure frequency reduction and in complete suppression of generalized seizures when comparing the two drugs, imepitoin and phenobarb. So sounds like that they're, they're actually pretty equivalent. It was a non-inferiority uh, study said, looks, they, it looks like they're the same. This was the study that found that the optimal dosage was around 19 mg per kg uh, twice a day. Um, and then when followed up at six months, the reduction of monthly seizure frequency was about 50% and around 20% seizure free. So it's still pretty good. Over 70% has some improvement. So uh, worth considering its use. Uh, but then this study uh, came out last year, 31 dogs uh, with idiopathic epilepsy um, started in mepitoin uh, between 10 to 20 mg per kg twice a day uh, and showed that the seizures decreased from a mean of 1.5 a month to just less than one a month, um, but that 67% developed clusters. Um, it's kind of an interesting fact and they followed these out for 18 months. 30 dogs in the phenobarb arm of this trial, because it was compared to phenobarb, using a pretty standard doses for phenobarb and showed that seizures also decreased, actually statistically more so than with imepitoin. Um, and also a chunk developing clusters, less developed clusters, proving really or, or suggesting really that imepitoin and phenobarb are not great for cluster seizures. Um, and so uh, at this stage, a suggestion that potassium bromide may have that niche in the market that will use that for cluster seizures. And one paper out there suggesting that potassium bromide probably should be considered in those cases, at least as an adjunct. Now, what about efficacy in the cat? Um, really not much out there. There's just one trial, uh, eight cats with idiopathic epilepsy um, that had focal or generalized seizures. Um, and because they were focal, then the monthly seizure frequency at, ba at baseline was an astonishing 57, 57 per month. I'm suggesting most of those then were focal. And so may bring into a bit of um, question, how easy were they to count? Um, so I, I gave you a counting machine here if you want to count focal cat seizures once you're done with this lecture. Um, uh, the, the, the treatment was given twice a day, 30 mg per kg, so pretty high, 30 mg per kg uh, twice a day, and they treated for eight weeks and four cats had seizure freedom, so 50%, so that's pretty good. Um, so may have some hope for cats and has been shown to be a pretty safe dr um, drug. Uh, what do we know in dogs? Um, one study showed, or that last study that where we compared imepitone and phenobob, that 22% had unacceptable adverse effects. And these included uh, the standard ones of ataxia, sedation, and then some GI stuff, polyphagia, and then PUPD. So kind of standard stuff, but pretty much like phenobar, bromide. Some hyperactivity was noted as well. And again, this is the dog matter analysis. So remember, this is percentage of studies, not individual animals. Um, so ataxia was noted as a side effect in just over 40% of studies, polyphagia over 40% of studies, not, not patients. Uh, and vomiting diarrhea was noted in a, f in a few as well. So um, some side effects, but overall meant to be a, a pretty safe drug. Um, and the same in cats, the majority of cases uh, had no adverse uh, effects in, in one safety study. Um, although some GI issues reported hypersalivation, a bit like levetiracetam as well, uh, anorexia, vomiting. Again, this is the meta-analysis here uh, and because it's the cat data this is percentage of cats so just over 10 percent will have vomiting and anorexia um, so seems to be a safe drug but at this stage we don't know a lot about efficacy um, so hope you enjoyed that whirlwind tour through uh, the three facts we need to know about anticonvulsants we've covered how to use these drugs based on some experience and what's in the literature and the formularies um, inclusive of how we monitor them and we've covered then what their expected efficacy is and what their adverse effects are and these are things which we need to take into account when choosing the drug respecting that some countries will have to choose the drug based on what, what's legally licensed. Um, if you have choices, you're also going to look not only at cost, but efficacy and adverse effects.
So thanks for that. Ran over time a little bit, but happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, we got a few questions. Our new member of the Vetorical team, as you can see, oh, managed. Sweet. You know, she Small managed. Microphone. She managed not to fall asleep, which uh, <laughs> say talk about the quality of your webinar. <laughs> no, she managed to take a piece on my lap, which is uh, another is good thing for her love about you. Yeah, uh, in some in some countries, that is a as a sign of love. Yeah, I know your um, hopefully past president um, has a, a special interest in that. <laughs> Just in Russia, where he never Just in Russia. Apology for anyone in Russia. Um, yeah, so we've got a question about, can you use pulse therapy in CAT uh, with Kepra? Uh, good question. Um, uh, I, I, I haven't, and I haven't seen anything out there. But there's no reason not to, I would say. Um, in that uh, it's supposedly effect effective um, and maybe if you use the XR you can get that into them. The, the other problem with the XR besides it being 100 milligrams per kilogram which one study said is safe they are massive capsules right to get that into a cat is a bit of a challenge um, and so you might have you might have some trouble if you have access to the XR giving that to a cat, and you can't really compound it because it's the caplet that that is in important for the actual extended release version. But there's no reason why you couldn't use that pulse therapy. Um, perhaps if you had them in hospital, it would be better to to obviously do the parenteral version if you can inject it. Then um, that would hold them a little bit better for for eight hours or so and then and then you could go to the oral version yeah there was another question about the pulse therapy um do you um only use it for that and then do you stop it after that till the next seizure so practically when do you start when do you stop you know if you yeah yeah i mean pull, yeah we know I, I sort of steered away a little bit from 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 cluster seizures and status epilepticus with the drugs because it's kind of a whole topic on its own but but that is a frustration cluster seizures and we have a way of of uh of trying to come up with something for the owners at home as well as how do we treat them in the hospital and 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 at home um we can give them clorazepate um as what as one option uh, sometimes we'll prescribe intranasal or rectal benzos um, but levotiracetam is another way that we can send owners home with pulse therapy meaning regardless of what they're on then they'll get extra um, dosing so maybe they're already on levotiracetam we'll give them extra at that time which works better based on its pharmacokinetics than phenobarb so we don't really top up phenobarb um, doesn't seem to be that effective in, in doing in doing something for the cluster seizure but topping up levotiracetam is um, seemingly effective now if you're not on levotiracetam you can just do it and then use it each and every time of cluster you don't have to use it as a long-term drug if you don't want to um, so it's just to try and break the cycle that we're using it for two or three days if you use um is pregabalin more potent than gabapentin in the treatment of refractory focal seizures um, as an adjunct treatment i would say uh, is it better to use pregabalin than gabapentin in general yeah, and we'll go to in general because there's a lot of layers there, but they're all yeah. important layers because they may may determine if they works or not. I, I left gabapentin and pregabalin out because uh, of time, but also there's not a lot of data out there on on their effect. In gabapentin, it's just a couple of retrospectives, uh, let's say about 50% efficacious, and there's just a small study on pregabalin that say the same sort of thing like four out of nine dogs i think uh um was a, is is effective and so it, it's we know it's a pretty safe drug the idea because it's the next generation of gabapentin is that it will be or is more potent slightly longer acting um than gabapentin uh so that would be a good reason to consider it if, if it's available to you at a reasonable price couple more questions there's a lot but obviously um we can't go through all of them i'm afraid if you got a, a patient with um toxicity um in that case next guard do you carry on anti-epileptic drug or you just treat um during the period uh, where it's fitting and then stop um i would say for um though for those 
patients, I would try to get them off the drug. Um, things like Nexgard, for instance, or any of the toxins really are not suggested to leave you with a permanent seizure focus unless you had such protracted status epilepticus that you got brain damage from it. But the toxins themselves in most cases um, won't, won't leave you with specific brain damage. And so I would try to wean them off it. So do it as a short term. And if you want something more objective, you could say, I'll treat you for a month. If you go seizure free for a month, I'll wean you down. If you're seizure free for another month, I'll try and take you off. Um, so, that, so we would hope that you're not lifelong. The last question. Um, would you recommend using anti epilepsy drug for focal seizures? I am the, under the impression that focal seizures don't respond to anti epileptic drug. Yeah, I mean, good question. I, I, I'd say I'd say I'm of the same impression that um, depending on what type of focal seizure, um, we will we'll really go right back to the start and say, do we need to treat them? There's some suggestion that they won't damage the brain anywhere near as, as much as a generalized seizure. Um, and so initially we're going to look at, is it affecting quality of life, both the dogs and the, and the owners? Um, and look to say, it, does it justify long-term anti lifelong anticonvulsant therapy um i do i do think that for some reason our drugs are not as effective it's an interesting question because in humans you'll get a different drug if you have focal seizures versus if you have generalized and we're not really that mechanistic in our approaches uh, so i i think I, I think it's probably a very good point at least to get over to the owner that this might not work um, and but we got to think about whether it's justified in the first place i think probably the only exception to that would be the myoclonic seizures with uh, levetiracetam either in yeah, cat yeah. um especially or cat with auditory seizures but um for example cavalier we tend to get these myoclonic seizures as well. And so probably it would be the only um, e exception to that. I'm afraid for everyone else who has question, um, there is a time where we have to close this presentation. Um, thanks again to our sponsor, PRN Pharmacal, for um, you know supporting us uh, and for providing you this webinar uh, for free. We leave the webinar on the webpage uh, for a month. So you got a, a, a whole month if you want uh, to access it. After that, uh, we will take the webinar um, off the webpage. Simon, thanks again for um, doing this presentation. I think everyone really enjoyed it. Um, and I wish everyone a good evening or a good day, depending where you are. And Simon, you got the last word um, to close this evening. Yep. Thanks, Laurent. Uh, thanks, Small White Fluffy, for attending. Love it. Uh, thanks, PR, PRN Pharmacol. Special shout out to uh, my residents, uh, uh, Dr. Dow Dor, Dr. Armstrong, Dr. Coos. Thanks for watching in. I'll expect your critique very soon. Uh, thanks to everyone for attending. Um, I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.